It wasn't too long after I watched the video that you did on discrete cosine transforming. And I was thinking about how music has patterns in it. And of course, uh, life imitates those sort of patterns. You get them with, with sort of number sequences within flowers and stuff like that. And I was thinking about how a really nice picture, how that could be translated to a piece of music and whether there was any kind of like correspondence between the patterns within a picture and the patterns within music. It was one of those moments late at night where I just sat down and thought, let's just do something. You know, and that's, that's the great thing about programming is you can just sit down and go, let's see what happens. I had this idea that you could turn pictures, sort of standard bitmaps or JPEGs or whatever, into music. And I didn't quite know how I was going to do it, whether I was going to use chords or get it to produce chords and different multi-layer instruments or just a single tune. So I think what I did is I just, just went straight in for it. I thought, I'll get a picture and I'll see what I can do with it. Excuse my drawing. So if this is the picture, and I'm sure you all know it's separated into a grid of pixels. I started in the top left with the first pixel there and numbered them on the way down so they work their way down the column. And then it would go back up to the top there and that would be the seventh one, that would be the eighth one, that would be the ninth one and so on. So in each pixel you've got the red, the green and the blue and then what I'm going to call L which is like the luminosity, how bright it is. And by using those four things I decided what sound I wanted to get out of it basically. So I generate um, a wave based on the information that I got from that pixel. So the red component was the length of the note. So if that pixel there had a lot of red in it, it would be a really long note. And if it had no red in it, it would be a really, really tiny note. I didn't let it go to zero. The smallest it could be, I believe, was a 255th of a quarter of a second, which is, <laughs> again, arbitrary amounts. I was just making this up. I mean, it really was, there was no, there's no, science to it as such. I was just thinking, oh, I wonder if I multiply the blue by this and do whatever, and it, and it ended up sounding nice. So the green channel was the octave it was in. A standard concert pitch A note, the note A is 440 hertz. The octave below it is 220 hertz. The octave below that is 110 hertz. So you halve it or you double it each time. So it's a logarithmic scale. It's not straightforward. So that, that decided the octave. And the blue decided the note within the octave. Each octave has 12 notes, and then there's several octaves. So if you get, let's say, an A1, the octave up from that will be the A2, and then the A-sharp one, the octave up from that will be A-sharp two, but there will always be 12 notes in each octave. So with these three values, the red, green, and blue values, which you can get from a pixel, I got the length, the octave, and which note within the octave I was gonna use. And then the last thing was the luminosity, which is how bright something is. Now, I think you've covered this in another video. You can sort of get a level and say that green is twice the brightness of red and blue. So you kind of halve the green value and you get what you call a perceived brightness level of it. And that said to me how loud the note was. So something very dark would be very quiet or, or the other way around? Or? Something very, very dark would not have a huge amount of red, green or blue. So it would be a very, very low note with very little length and very little loudness. It's almost like it might not be there. Which, and the brighter the picture, the, the longer the whole thing becomes. You get more length on the note, you get higher notes, you get more variation in the tones between them and it becomes a lot, lot louder. The only thing I did then was I wrote something which then took that note and fixed it to a scale. So I wanted to... So this is to do with... This is more to do with making it sound musical. You know, I, sometimes you've got 12 notes of the scale and sometimes you put those two notes next to each other and they sound quite horrible. So I wanted to limit it to sort of seven notes, which made it a major scale or a minor scale. It's a bit like they do with vocals with auto-tune. Someone sings out of tune and then it moves it to the nearest note. Um, so after... Because after I'm assuming if you hadn't have done that, that it could have sounded like a chimpanzee falling on a piano. It would have sounded interesting. I'm sure. But I, I limited it. I mean, I did that afterwards. I produced some stuff and uh, I just thought, oh, I'll have a listen through to that. And it didn't sound as nice as if I restricted the, restricted the scale down a little bit. So that was almost like a side chain. I produced the frequency and then I just sent it off to a function which did something and then 
brought it back. And I could change that function depending on what vibe I wanted in the music. Um, and that was, that was something which I haven't put on the website. Um, I've put all the code for this on my website, with the exception of that bit, because I thought, that's more down to the person that's composing the piece of music. You know, you can limit the scale and decide what, what you want and what you don't want based on uh, your own choices. You know, I've done 90% of the work. <laughs> but um, so I ran through, I, I picked um, some photos on my original Pixel Noise music. I did it with six photos. For this one here, I thought the first thing to do, let's grab the computer file logo and run that through. Um, the first thing I did was shrink it down to a smaller image because a big image can produce quite a long file. I mean, something which is maybe 90 pixels by 50 pixels, if it's quite bright, will produce an 11, 12 minute WAV file. And, um, you know, 11, 12 minutes of something going blah, 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 like that can be a little bit dull. This is a classic example of what I was talking about earlier where you don't get much data out. As you can see here, there's a lot of black pixels and then there's only really one color coming through, although there are shades, uh, little bits of red and little bits of blue in there. So it wasn't gonna produce anything which sounded particularly musical. In the same way that you discussed that JPEG compression works better on natural images and not on text and stuff like that, the same is true with this. It produces better results from photos, things that are actually taken that have got natural shading or whatever, than something that's a piece of text that's, that's, that's not, I don't know, it's not nature in any way, it's not natural in any way. So um, let me play you the result for that, if I minimise this for a second. It is going down and getting almost no data from the first column, almost no data from the second column. By the time it gets here, you've got a tiny little bit there, and then it goes across there and makes a noise, then it goes across there, and then you start getting two little bits, two little bits next to each other, and then you've got the same here, and then you've got longer bits, and then two bits with the gap in between, and then, of course, the same reverse out. It's very clearly in three sections, and you can see the first bit with the bracket, you can see goes there, and then as it gets into the, the, the two lines, you can see it having, a, having two bits of waves, and then the C is there, and then this one here is effectively a reverse of that one. So this wave does quite nicely show the computer file logo, but it's not that musical. So that moved me on um, to my first computer, which was an Acorn Electron, and I ran this through. Because it's quite bright, it produced a lot nicer result. When you get into the keyboard. It makes some, uh, makes some more interesting tunes. Do you know what it reminds me of? We did a sorting with music and graphics yes. video on an Acorn machine. It was on an Archimedes. Archimedes was yeah. an I've got an Archimedes A3000 upstairs. <laughs> These are the kind of things that when I'm bored, I sit there at night and buy one on eBay for oh, 16 pounds. I've got to have an A3000, never plugged it in. What's the, what am I going to do with it? But. So we're still hearing tones here. So how then do you turn that into say, say something maybe a bit more musical? What, what have you been doing? Okay, with I've got down here on the floor, a whole load of guitar pedals that most of the time I use for playing guitar. But I put some delay on it. If you don't know what delay is, it's like an echo. You know when you shout somewhere and you go, hello, and it comes back and goes, hello, like that, and you hear it bounce around. Well, you can artificially put that on things so it repeats itself and, and sounds a lot bigger, and you can put reverb on things to make sure it sound like it's in a big chamber. And of course, you can distort things. And one of the fun things about using things like valve amps and pedals is whatever is the amount of distortion you can put on stuff and distorted guitar. So that's when it sounds fuzzy, right? It's fuzzy. It's, it just makes it sound sound more more rock. And so all those big guitar solos that you know from from all the classic rock tunes are all really really distorted a lot of the time. So if I play you what this electron picture sounds like uh, with distortion and delay on. If I skip it on a bit, I've just put in some drum loops. So then you can start just improvising over the top of it. Mm -hmm. 
I know out of the original 40 odd minute piece of music, there's a few moments in it that I think could be turned into quite nice songs. And I probably will extract those moments. I won't keep it true to using the whole picture. I'll just take out the little melodies I like from the generated wave and then I'll loop them round and make songs out of them. So I think from that point of view, it was valid to do, to go through the whole thing, to lift something that might make two songs. Now, if you were Coldplay, for example, and you were spending a year doing an album, considering I did this in a couple of evenings, a, you know, to produce a 40 minute piece of music that might inspire two songs is really not that, you know, it's not that crazy to do. You know, Pink Floyd spent years, well not years, but months and months in a year recording household objects, you know, pinging elastic bands and stuff like that, trying to get some inspiration for the album that eventually became Wish You Were Here. So, some people got it and went, wow, this is amazing. But the people who didn't like it tend to put it on and listen to the first minute or two and go, this sounds like nonsense to me, and then turn it off. And I'd say, I mean, it's, it's no different to a bit of software. If you download a bit of software and try it and you can't get your head around it within two minutes and you just go, no, oh, that's rubbish, I'll throw it away. And I understand most people don't have 40 minutes spare in their day to sit and listen through to a load of synthy nonsense that I've produced them, and I don't expect them to, but some people do, you know, and, and that's, that's the joy of creating something that is attempting to be brand new, is that, you know, it will get, and someone retweets it and someone else goes, and of course this, in itself, you've picked up on it and we're doing this and someone else might listen to it and, you know, it might get 500 plays, it might get 5,000 plays one day, who knows? I mean, it's not. That's it, really. So the number of slices per second that it does is the sample frequency. And obviously, the more of those you put in per second,